Hello and welcome back. In this video I wanted to revisit my trip to another contaminated exclusion zone. After visiting the one in Chernobyl, if you are interested you can find the link down below, I also visited the one around Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant. As I said in my Ukraine video, I have always been fascinated with everything nuclear. Another thing I am fascinated with is Japan history, architecture, organization and tradition of that country left a lasting impression on me since childhood. So far I have visited Japan two times, first time in 2015. I tried to visit the zone then, but at that time it was possible only for journalists on organized trips. With my journalist credentials, I wrote to Tokyo Electric Power Company, the operator of the power plant. They told me I had just missed the last tour for that year. Still, they were kind enough to offer me a presentation about the matter in their Tokyo offices. The trip to the actual site had to wait. The opportunity came in early 2019, when I visited Japan again. This time I wasn't alone, my girlfriend Matea traveled with me. At that time there were already official tours to the restricted zone. Local government wanted to make the rebuilding effort as transparent as possible. That is the reason Real Fukushima Agency was founded and started taking interested tourists into the zone. We signed up for the tour organized on the 5th of January 2019. They sent us instructions to meet the guide at Odaka Station at 10.05. Thanks to the impeccable punctuality of Japanese transportation, we got there without any trouble. Starting from our hotel in central Tokyo, we traveled with Shinkansen to Sendai, and then switched to local trains. We arrived at the rendezvous point exactly 5 minutes before the start of the tour. We met the rest of the group for that day. With us there was an American who had moved to Narita to teach English, and two friends from Hungary. As we learned later, one of them is a stunt double working in the movie industry. He even recently worked in our hometown of Dubrovnik, on a 2018 version of Robin Hood. The movie didn't turn out to be good as many had hoped, but he had fond memories of our town. Our guide was a lovely Japanese lady who spoke very good English. She boarded us into a long Nissan with three rows of seats and we set off. Already at the start we were given printed materials explaining the accident and what was being done to repair the damage. To recap the situation and put it simply, on that fateful afternoon of March 11, 2011, the strongest earthquake in recorded Japanese history hit the eastern coast of Japanese island Honshu. Its strength of 9.0 on the Richter scale was enough to raise several towns to the ground. It also created a catastrophic tsunami. Waves went ashore, damaging and flooding the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant located directly on the ocean coast. Interruption in the power supply to the pumps of the reactors caused meltdowns in three of them. Radioactive material was released into the environment. Because of that, the government issued an evacuation order for the area around the power plant. After a lot of heroic work, power was restored and reactors were cooled. Since then, all six reactors of the power plant are being disassembled. The surrounding area is being decontaminated and rebuilt. Both Matea and me were surprised by another part of the Fukushima disaster story which we did not know earlier. Daiichi is translated as first, so there is also Fukushima Daini, or the second. 
only about 11 kilometers to the south another nuclear power plant is located. This one has four reactors and came into same trouble as its sister up north. After the earthquake it went into shutdown mode. When the tsunami arrived the plant was flooded and because of the interruption in the power supply pumps failed here as well. Three of the reactors were in danger to suffer catastrophic meltdowns. Thanks to even more heroic work, workers of the plant managed to reconnect the power and stabilize the reactors. They managed to lay 9 kilometers of new cables in flooded power plant. They used sections weighting about a ton each and did it in record time. Thanks to that, an even larger catastrophe was avoided. The differences between the shapes of Chernobyl and Fukushima zone are substantial. As Chernobyl exploded on the flat plains of Ukraine, the zone was set up in a 30 km radius in all directions. That was still deemed insufficient by some, but zone turned out circular in shape in the end. The geography of Japan is different and consists of central mountains which go like a spine through the center of the islands. Those central mountains branch towards the sea with smaller hills forming valleys between them. At the end of one such valley, Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant is located. After the spread of the contaminants, they were fairly contained in that valley. That way, the part which remains mostly contaminated today turned out long but narrow instead of circular in shape. Because of this, there are traffic corridors passing through the zone. A couple of main roads and train lines had to be decontaminated so traffic to the north could continue normally. All the exits from these corridors are closed off and guarded. The Shinkansen Hayabusa, with which we arrived, passed through the parts of the zone. Japan is already facing a shortage of free space, so every piece of soil is valuable. That is why they are working on reclaiming as much as possible of the contaminated land. Large parts of the area, which was initially designated as dangerous, has since been cleaned and declared safe. Tourists like us are enticed to visit and those who have fled are encouraged to return. Beside promoting the fact that the tours are safe, organizers, Real Fukushima Agency, wanted to distance the experience from the one portrayed in the documentary series Dark Tourist. Series follows a journalist exploring weird tourist attractions. In his episode set in Japan, he also claims to visit the zone in Fukushima. The episode is heavily sensationalized and radiation values were presented as being much higher and more toxic than they actually were. We were also given a written note about the episode. After watching the episode and going on a tour, I saw that they didn't even film inside the contaminated area. The guide presented is also not working for the real Fukushima agency, so it couldn't have been an official trip as it was presented. The first location we visited was a farm located on the outskirts of the town of Namie. It is a special farm called Ranch of Hope and now acts as a kind of refuge for cows. Masami Yoshizawa founded the ranch to take care of the cows which were left behind after the incident. After the evacuation order was given, farmers were forced to leave all of their livestock behind. A lot of animals starved to death because they stayed alone in closed barns. The world's most expensive beef, the famous Wagyu, was also produced here. The price of 400 American dollars per kilogram was achieved by taking special care of the animals. 
it is easy to see why the farmers bonded so much with them. Mr. Yoshizawa returned when the area was deemed safe and gathered all the animals which he could still find alive. He now takes care of them with his volunteers. Also, he regularly protests against the government. He still considered them responsible for what happened because they didn't force the company operating the plant to make it safer. He also says that locals were resentful of the power plant as it generated the electricity for Tokyo down south and not for them. They saw power plant only as an employment opportunity as there were very few alternatives. During our visit his volunteers were unloading a shipment of food for the cows. They heavily rely on donations to feed them. This latest shipment consisted of several truckloads of expired pineapples. The combined smell of sweet pineapples and cow manure created a sweet sour stench which continues to haunt Matea and me to this day. After the visit to the Ranch of Hope we continued through the town of Namie. It is located a bit north of the power plant. At one point we were no longer driving between the buildings. A large, almost completely flat field lies between the end of town and the sea. The first hills start about a kilometer and a half inland. While driving through the overgrown field, the guide told us that this actually also used to be a part of the town and tsunami swept it away. Only parts of the city which were high enough were left standing. To our horror, we finally understood why there were occasional crumbling structures scattered along the road. This used to be a fishing part of Namie and usually a lot of boats were docked in the harbor. Now it was full of construction vehicles. After the tsunami and the incident, construction began on a huge new defensive wall. Parts of the coasts were already protected but it turned out that it wasn't enough. That is why kilometers of new walls were being constructed and old parts expanded. The power plant itself was also protected by walls, but they proved to be insufficient. They were built for waves of up to 6.5 meters high, but tsunami created waves up to 14 meters high. There were studies before the incident that such a scenario could happen, but were ignored by the company and the government. That is another reason why the locals were still resentful of them. We made the stop at the local school, whose empty walls still stand. A clock overlooking the courtyard was still showing the exact moment when the tsunami struck and the electricity was cut. On the second floor of the building we could still see how high the sea flooded on the day of the catastrophe. What amazed us was that the tsunami alert was sounded less than 10 minutes after the earthquake. The system detected the danger of a tsunami and civilians were instructed to evacuate. Local designated safe area was a hill about a kilometer away, as our guide showed us. People had about half an hour of time to get to the safer areas. At this school everybody fled on time. Unfortunately, not everyone was so lucky in another nearby school. Staff was following protocol which dictated that children needed to be counted before leaving. That way they wasted precious minutes during which wave was getting closer. We were wondering how would our authorities at home react and how much of a warning would we get, if any. From the school we continued to the hill which became a safe haven for the survivors from Namie. 
Here a new cemetery was built for the casualties of that day and a memorial was erected next to it. The guide showed us lines of beautiful Japanese letters explaining that those are names of people who lost their lives. She pointed out that there are so many similar groups of symbols as those are the same surnames. Same surnames meant that a lot of families were lost in the day of the tragedy. From the cemetery we returned to the center of town to have lunch. Our guide took us to a small business zone with various shops. She explained that the government funded this area to provide various services and employment opportunities. This is all part of an effort to entice people to return to areas damaged by the earthquake. We sat down in a lovely restaurant named Grandma, run exclusively by old ladies. I heard a lot about how Japanese elderly people stay active until late in life, but this was the most concrete example I saw until then. They were happy to see us and greeted us with big smiles. We ordered food and the ramen I had was really delicious. They were also very interested in where we are from. I found some pictures of the old city walls of Dubrovnik on my phone and showed it to them. They got very excited and said that they knew it and how beautiful it was. After lunch we continued our trip through the zone and observed how the cleanup operation was proceeding. All scrap has been neatly collected and grouped and debris cleaned. We saw fields full of large bags filled with the top part of the soil from surrounding areas. After the incident, radioactive material from the reactors fell on the top layer of the soil. That layer was being dug up in the whole area before the contaminated particles started sinking deeper. Much of the soil was being burned in special incinerators. What remained was being buried in specially designated safe areas. We traveled the road leading through the restricted zone and made a turn from it. We entered into a still irradiated area. Each of us carried our personal radiation counter and I have volunteered to carry the main one. It was covered in a protective casing and synced with the smartphone of our guide. It started showing larger and larger values, still they were harmless on shorter periods of exposure. She explained that roads are safe but that surrounding areas were still not decontaminated. All the vegetation which is growing from soil which wasn't excavated is showing values higher than usual. She took the counter I was carrying and threw it in the bushes. Values increased several fold. After that I was no longer so keen on carrying it, even if it was in a protective cover. We followed the road all the way to the sea, where we stopped next to some large demolished buildings. The sea, which was so peaceful now, was slowly hitting the concrete barriers in the shallow water. On the left side we could see Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant only about a kilometer away. Guide explained us that they used to grow fish here. Demolished structures used to be covered fish pools. To help the fish grow, they used warm water from the reactor. It wasn't causing any mutations, as the water is perfectly safe, it is just heated and needs to be cooled. This way it is useful in the process and the principle is used in many nuclear power plants around the world. Next stop was a small hill a little inland, about a kilometer away from the area of the power plant. This is the closest that you can get to it on this tour. In the distance the main buildings and remains of the reactors can be seen. They are surrounded by cranes slowly disassembling the whole plant. Big piles of bags filled with contaminated materials could be seen stacked around them. 
huge tanks filled with contaminated seawater were arranged in symmetrical shapes. Very close, even closer to the plant than in Pripyat, we could see the first houses. This was the town of Okuma, where most of the employees of the power plant lived. The population of the town was around 15,000 and they all had to be evacuated in one morning. The power plant was operating a total of six reactors, another two were planned for future expansion. In 1986, the year of the Chernobyl disaster, Fukushima Daiichi was world's most powerful nuclear power plant. Second was Vladimir Ilyich Lenin power plant in Chernobyl and the third Gravelin in France. Of the three, only the French one is still intact. An abandoned retirement home is located on the hill where we were standing. Its residents were also evacuated on the day of the incident. The whole parking lot and home were frozen in time from the moment of the incident. Even the off-duty personnel was called to help with the evacuation. Many of them dropped whatever they were doing and rushed here to help. Parking lot was still filled with cars left where they had parked them for the last time. On the back seats we could see laundry and shopping bags left in a hurry. We saw the most chilling detail in one of the cars to the right of the main building. Under the windshield there was a figure of Minnie Mouse sitting on a dashboard. What made it unsettling was that it was still shaking its head as it watched us. As it was solar powered, it was still going even eight and a half years after being abandoned in that parking lot. The last part of the trip was dedicated to a visit to the center of the town of Okuma. It is the closest one to the power plant and in the center of the restricted zone. Unrepaired damage from the earthquake can be seen on the houses and grass is starting to grow out of the pavement. The town was standing as its residents left it on the day of the evacuation. Our guide explained that these are still officially people's properties and that they can visit it on a limited basis after they file a request with the authorities. While walking down the main street, an unsettling hum could be heard. It sounded like something straight out of horror movies. Most likely the cause was pressure building in the water pipes nobody was maintaining. The sound created the whole abandoned area even more spooky. While the guide was taking us back to our train stations, we could see the new future they were trying to build for Fukushima. In areas which were decontaminated, the government is investing in new buildings and rebuilding towns. In that time, they were already building a new Okuma on safer grounds. They believe people will return and find new hope even in a place hit with three catastrophic events at the same time. Another mission they have put forward is to make this area generate power again. Instead of breaking atoms, this time they're doing it with fields full of solar panels. During the tour we saw hundreds of them being installed across fields that were left empty after the tsunami. New protective walls should now make sure that the future of Fukushima would not get demolished again. 
After seeing the sites of the world's two worst nuclear disasters, the one in Chernobyl and the one in Fukushima, it is interesting to draw parallels. On one side it is said that the second one even happened after the disaster in Ukraine. Protocols for handling nuclear power plants should have become accident proof. Still, my impression is that the one in Fukushima was handled much better, not only because it occurred in a democratic country with better technology, but also because there was some unfortunate previous experience about the subject. It was, at least in some way, easier to approach a problem for which a solution was found once already. Evacuated zones also look different. Even though more time has passed since the Chernobyl accident, it is obvious that the exclusion zone there was looted and demolished in the process. Much of that came from poor control caused by the dissolution of the Soviet Union. The one in Fukushima is controlled much better. Here it is really possible to see a glimpse of the post-apocalyptic world. This is how the world would look like if all the people would suddenly disappear. On this excursion to the zone I also learned a lot about Japan as well. On Balkans people are used to not liking their governments. It seemed weird to see how much of that was true in Japan as well. People there also have real reasons to be distrustful of their government. While the power plant was operating, certain laws were being avoided. Other warnings were ignored. The company which operated it was not forced to change that. Also, it was clumsy in handling a disaster of such proportions. Unfortunately, it took a large disaster as it was this one, but the situation changed. The regulations for operating nuclear power plants are now being enforced. Other plants with suspicious safety records were shut down permanently. Areas of Fukushima are being rebuilt and turned toward green energy. A country which I love so much turned out to be more real than I might have imagined it before. Did that diminish my love for it? Not in the slightest. It is important to see that everyone experiences a real trouble. Most important is to handle those troubles as good as you can when they happen and to learn from your mistakes.